As global temperatures rise, the polar ice caps are disappearing at an alarming rate. As a result, more and more icebergs are showing up in the warmer waters of Canada. Tracking the growing number of icebergs is crucial because understanding how they move and how they disintegrate is the key to understanding the melting of Arctic ice. I'll see how it's done. From above, the waves just shooting high up into the air up against the bergs. From below, and from the very top of an iceberg on the moon. I'm going to place the beacon. Melting ice is Earth's warning signal, and icebergs are sounding an alarm bell about our climate's future. I'm in Newfoundland, Canada, on the Atlantic coast, the iceberg capital of the world. Every spring, thousands of icebergs travel from the Arctic down the 1,600-mile stretch of ocean called Iceberg Alley. 1% make it as far south as St. John's. These icebergs are really amazing. Most of them are formed off of the glaciers on western Greenland. They're born when the glaciers calve into the Davis Strait, and a lot of them end up floating south. It's a three-year journey from the Arctic, circling counterclockwise around Baffin Bay. The icebergs flow into the Labrador Current, which propels them past Newfoundland and Labrador, all the way down to the southern tip of the province. They arrive here every year, but their increase in numbers is an ominous indicator of what's happening to the Greenland ice sheet. It's the second largest ice sheet in the world, and it's melting fast, shrinking 47 cubic miles a year. David Barber has been studying the Arctic for 30 years. Well, there's lots and lots of evidence all pointing in exactly the same direction, that climate change is very much alive and well in the Arctic, and it's really affecting the marine cryosphere in general. From snow cover to ice sheets, the cryosphere is the term scientists use for frozen water on the surface of the Earth. And right now, it's in a precarious state. The melting is leading to a rise in ocean levels worldwide, a big threat to coastal communities. The warming waters are also affecting global weather patterns. And that's not all. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet is accelerating the production of icebergs. They're massive, they're very dense, and if you're in a ship that hits one of those, it's gonna cause a tremendous amount of damage. Nowhere else in the world do icebergs intersect with major shipping lanes and fishing zones. Collisions can be deadly. It's up to the International Ice Patrol and U.S. Coast Guard to make sure that doesn't happen. And last year was a really crazy year, apparently. Yes, last year uh, was, uh, was the sixth most severe we've had on record since 1900. We had over 1,500 icebergs drift south. Today, I get to see their high-tech iceberg monitoring gear in action. This year, almost 900 bergs have been spotted, and we're only halfway through the season. On the plane here today, we've got the pilot, we've got co-pilot, we've got someone operating the radar, and two guys, and all their job is, is to spot icebergs. Icebergs are an extreme hazard, obviously. Just over 100 years ago, the Titanic, probably the most famous shipwreck of all when it comes to iceberg collisions, went down not too far from here. There have been uh, several instances over the last couple of years where ships have deflected off of an iceberg. None of them were damaged so badly that they sank. There have been just over 50 collisions since 1980, causing hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. Tracking buoys with sensors are deployed from the back of the plane. They're designed to read the currents, which help determine where the icebergs are going and how fast. I see them crashing and the waves just shooting high up into the air up against the bergs. From up here, looking down, it's really hard to tell just how big these icebergs are. Icebergs can vary in size, from that of a small car to ones the size of Manhattan. The Ice Patrol is collecting some of the most detailed information for this area. It's entered into a database and shared internationally with climate scientists studying what happens to icebergs in warmer water. Of course, the Arctic and Antarctic regions are the places on the planet that are most affected by climate change right now. Global temperatures there in the polar regions are about double what they have been. And as temperatures rise, 
the speed of the glacier will actually increase. And of course, the faster that glacier is moving, the more of that ice is going to end up in the water each year. Melting Arctic ice disintegrates spectacularly into icebergs. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The Peterman Glacier in northern Greenland caught the world's attention in 2010 when satellite images captured a 100 square mile ice island breaking off. Just two years later, another one, 50 square miles, also fell away. Scientists are trying to get an idea of what will happen in the future. Brad DeYoung is a professor of oceanography at Memorial University. What you're always looking for are the big changes, but to determine those, sometimes you have to separate out the kind of the year-to-year -year variability. The variability one might expect to see decade to decade, but the other is the larger scale kind of climate story. In order to understand the rate of change, oceanographers are now studying icebergs in more detail because the way icebergs break up down here mimics the disintegration of the ice shelves in the Arctic. What we want to do is to, is to make measurements on different kinds of bergs in different situations and also we look at a particular iceberg and ask what's happening to it. And so make repeated measurements of the same iceberg. Right. See how its shape changes, Over time. how it's melting. Melting ice shelves are very bad news. Ice shelves are dense floating sheets of ice at the end of a glacier, sometimes up to 3,000 feet thick. They're vital because they act as a huge doorstop, pushing against the glaciers, slowing their flow into the ocean. Without ice shelves, the glaciers would melt more rapidly into the sea, causing a rise in global sea levels. Today, I'm in Conception Bay at the southeast corner of Newfoundland. I'm taking a closer look at icebergs that have made the 1,600-mile journey from Greenland. I want to see how they travel through these waters. If we've got changes in the environment, such as warmer waters, different currents, different wind patterns, it's going to affect how these icebergs travel through Iceberg Alley. So the mission is to get out and actually climb onto one of these icebergs and place a satellite tracking beacon on it. I'll then be able to track it over the next few days. Captain, iceberg, get ahead. The cold and the beautiful. Without any warning, these birds can flip, roll over, or break apart. Oh. This will be a climb unlike any I've tried before. Holy crap. I want to get up on the berg and place a beacon on it to track its movement and melt rate. Oh. But it's not going to be easy. Holy crap. What do you think of that, Jerk? Don't want to climb a berg? <laughs> not that one. That's scary. What was once this towering berg is now this pile of thousands of pieces. Bubbles. Get this effervescent sound, all this bubbles, air bubbles coming up out of the ice. Let's be gassing. Wow. With zero warning. Really drives home how dangerous these things can be when you're up close to them. A bit shaken, we move to one that looks promising to climb. That is a beautiful, beautiful iceberg. Mm. We'll do a circumnavigation. If this iceberg were to roll that way, this piece of ice would come up underneath us. OK, Rick. Hey. I'm going to place the tracking beacon as high as possible, as I want to see how long this berg stays intact and how far it goes. OK. Information like this helps scientists understand the breakup of icebergs. The ice is, it's a little softer than I was expecting, because it's all melting. All right, continuing up. There's water spray coming up, pressurized up over here. Bird feathers up here. Ah, oh, the angle on this is perfect. It's nice and gentle. What a view. I want to get a little bit further over. I don't dare go any higher up. Too dangerous right here where I'm standing. 
Here's a good spot right here. All right, just putting an ice screw in right now. Whew. The wind's really picking up here. I'm securing the beacon and tying it off with rope so it can be retrieved later. Okay, the rope is in the water. The tracking beacon is retrievable. I'm going to start working my way back. Perfect. This thing has traveled probably several years down from the Greenland glacier. Now, let's see where it goes from here. Tracking icebergs is one way to study climate change, but I want to explore other methods that'll take me into dangerous waters. Icebergs offer valuable clues about the melting Arctic ice that spawned them. And it's not just the increase in their numbers that's concerning scientists. It's a coupled system. You can't really look at one part of the thing without looking at all the other parts that are interconnected because they all operate with each other in a very uh, sophisticated harmony. Scientists are noticing that sea ice, the frozen seawater, is also melting fast and raising the temperature of the water around it. When you think about the sea ice, we're thinking right now we're going to have a seasonally ice free Arctic. That stuff that's left at the end of the summer will actually shrink and disappear, you know, somewhere between 2030 and 2050. Disappear completely? Disappear completely in summer. That's scary. The sea ice keeps the oceans cool because when the surface is covered in ice, it's white, so the energy from the sun is reflected back into space, keeping the Arctic cold. But when the ice melts, the heat from the sun is absorbed into the sea, causing it to warm. And when water heats up, it expands, raising sea levels. But that's not the only problem. Melting sea ice and glaciers also change the ocean's currents. In the oceans, we have what's called the thermohaline circulation, the movement of warm water from the equator northward. All that sea and glacier ice melting and mixing together is disrupting those currents. The amount of fresh water that are coming from these things is going to change the circulation patterns of the ocean because the fresh water is very buoyant and so it tends to come to the surface and the salt water underneath it, which then affects the currents. Scientists predict that 210,000 square miles of polar ice a decade will melt into the ocean. Changing currents will affect world weather patterns causing more ferocious storms and extreme snowfalls. The next morning, I head back to Conception Bay. My mission today is to explore the underwater part of these bergs. The base of an iceberg is rarely ever seen, but how it deteriorates in warming water helps scientists understand future melt rates in the Arctic. We hear the phrase, tip of the iceberg, all the time, meaning that there's a lot more hidden underneath. 90% of an iceberg is underwater. For the largest bergs, that can be as big as a five-story building. If all goes well today, I'm gonna get to show you what it's like below the surface. A tricky dive, lots of variables, very cold water. So this should be really interesting. Dive master John Olivero is an experienced iceberg diver. There is gonna be a little bit of cracking and popping. Um, concerned of any of the noises, just start swimming away. If you see anything coming down at you, the way in down. The way in down. Yeah, it's, it's only dangerous if something goes wrong. Yeah. There we go. There's a couple of icebergs out in the bay right now, so we're going to try and find the best one to go diving on, get in the water, and actually see these things from underneath. It can be hard for scientists to study these giant moving blocks of ice as they're so unpredictable. We need to find one that looks stable enough to dive near. George, I like this one because if it breaks, gravity is going to take it that way. So you guys got lots of chance to swim away. With the bird chosen, we get suited up. Johnny drops a safety buoy, but right away, there's trouble. We reposition further out, and I hit the water. This berg is massive, at least 100 feet deep. It's an incredible sight. The scars of erosion can be seen everywhere. 
including these cracks and pockmarks all over. Wind, waves, and warm sea temperatures melt away the icebergs, slowly breaking them up. In examining the rate of decline, scientists are also looking at whether or not ocean water changes the way the iceberg melts. The deep icebergs, if they're melting at the bottom, then there's a plume of fresh water that's coming up. And so we want to look at whether the interaction of that with the ocean water changes the way the iceberg itself melts. So is the iceberg kind of influencing its own environment in a way that changes how the melting takes place? If scientists can understand these processes, they can make more accurate predictions for the future of the ice cap. It's a real challenge diving in these conditions. Something's gone wrong, and there's much more at stake now than just our research. I'm diving under an iceberg, getting images of its erosion. But I'm having some serious trouble. Get him out! Get him out! Look at him! I'm very close to being seasick. Yeah. Help him. I have to call the dive off. The conditions were really difficult down there. Despite all the struggles I was having underwater, it was still a, a sight to behold. Seeing this massive berg underwater. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So <laughs> I still got a lot of fight in me, but not so much more today. After a night of rest, I join a crew on a ship looking for icebergs. But it's not for science. These 10,000-year-old ice blocks happen to contain some of the purest fresh water in the world. And the demand for it is growing. It is very early in the morning, up at 3.30, meeting up with <laughs> the iceberg cowboy, Ed Keen. What we're going to do, he's going to push her around. Right? Then you guys just slack it out, and he'll go around him, right? Just take our time. We're not in no big hurry. We are. But we got to take our time. He's an iceberg wrangler who sells iceberg water. The water is very pure because it's ancient, tens of thousands of years old, and there's a market for it. The crew heads out to capture a bird. We lasso it. We take a rope in the speedboat around and tie it off, and then we use a winch to pull us tight to the iceberg. Nobody owns the icebergs, so it's legal to catch them and break them up before they would naturally melt. But it's a dangerous job. Yeah, you got to treat them with respect. Some big icebergs with uh, pentacles and overhangs on them, and uh, it's just too dangerous. A big barge like this is really difficult to maneuver, so they used a small boat to give it a bit of a nudge to get it perfectly positioned to get the machinery in there to get the ice. We needed to get the barge away from this shelf that's underwater. If this iceberg flips right now, it'll take the barge, the motorboat, and all of us along with it. These guys have learned that lesson the hard way. Last year, we had one roll on us that was, uh, it was, uh, it was pretty bad. Iceberg ice has been compressed for thousands of years, so it's incredibly dense. Ed positions the cranes so the excavator can take the first bites. Iceberg ice has been locked in ancient glaciers, which formed before the Industrial Age, making it free of contaminants. So right now, he's dropping the ice directly into those front tanks. And then they use the grinder if they want to send it to the tanks at the back, but then shift the weight. And we force water, iceberg water, from the tank in, and it flows down into the other tanks. And how many liters of water will you gather in one season? Oh, we're looking at probably a million, two or three this year. These guys have been at it for about four or five hours now, and they've put a serious dent in that chunk of ice. By late afternoon, they wrap it up and head back to shore with their haul. It's been an adventurous week for me in Iceberg Alley, but before I head home, there's one more place I need to go. I'm gonna check on the status of that iceberg I was tracking. So it's been about three days since I put the transmitter on the iceberg up here at Bay de Verde, and an interesting thing has happened. We've had strong winds from the north, which, as you might expect, has pushed that iceberg to the south 
about halfway into Conception Bay. And last night, it stopped transmitting. The iceberg has probably broken up, and the transmitter is sitting at the bottom of the bay. It traveled almost 15 miles in three days. It really does go to show how much these things move around out here. As icebergs continue to flow into these waters off Newfoundland, they're a mixed blessing. They offer scientists a chance to further understand the process of Arctic melting, but they're also an unmistakable warning about the dramatic decline of our ice sheets. Continuing the detailed research and sharing it worldwide will enhance our ability to combat climate change. Keeping the planet cool by just one to two degrees would help preserve this frozen world. It's gonna cost us a lot more not to do something about this problem than it is for us to do something about this problem, so let's keep our habitat so that it works for us as a, as a species. Scientists have spoken. Now it's time for governments and individuals to take action. I'm in Siberia, the coldest inhabited place on Earth. As global temperatures rise, this enormous icy land is melting. The entire region is built on top of permafrost, which is now thawing at an alarming rate. The ground is collapsing, traditional ways of life are threatened, and large amounts of previously trapped methane gas are seeping into the atmosphere. Siberia's big thaw could have a catastrophic effect on the entire planet. This is Red Eye Flight number three of three, heading to the city of Yakutsk in Siberia. We're on our way to one of the most northerly cities in Russia. Just 280 miles from the Arctic Circle, six time zones from Moscow. I'm joined by Aliona Pimenova, who'll be my translator and guide as I travel to some of the coldest places on Earth. It's my first time in Siberia. It's an enormous region that covers 77% of Russia. To put it in perspective, it takes up about 10% of the land mass on Earth. It is massive. And a good portion of that is permafrost, that land that is frozen all the time except for that top layer that freezes in the winter, thaws in the summer. 70% of Russia lies on permafrost. It's a permanently frozen layer below the Earth's surface, made up of layer after layer of soil, sediment, rock, and ice, built up over thousands of years. So, how deep does it go? Yakutsk has what I need to find out. The deepest hole in permafrost anywhere. And it just so happens they're doing maintenance on it today. Are they going to work right now? They're trying to get rid of the ice. It's called the Shurgan Shaft, Started in 1827 and now 380 feet deep, built to explore how far down the frozen ground goes. It's really amazing how deep this shaft really is. There's a chart here on the wall. The worker that's down there right now is about here. It goes a long way down. Information acquired here shows that the permafrost in Siberia is some of the thickest in the world a mile and a half deep in some places. The entire city of Yakutsk is built on it, which has led to some peculiar adaptations. One thing about building a city on permafrost is the top layer, well, it's not so permanent. So a lot of the buildings here in Yakutsk are actually up on these concrete stilts. It's the only way to keep the foundations from warping when it melts and refreezes. Installing and repairing pipes in frozen ground, extremely difficult. So what they've done is put them above ground and insulated the hell out of them. Infrastructure and houses are vulnerable to the shifting ground. Some of the buildings here in Yakuts are actually twisting and sinking into the permafrost. This is known as subsidence. The top layer refreezes each winter, but to varying thicknesses as Siberia gets warmer. 
Today, it's minus one degree Celsius, which is far from normal. The average winter temperature here in Yakutsk is actually minus 34 degrees. It is nowhere near that today. The skaters are enjoying this warm spell. Siberia is one of the fastest warming places on the planet. And that has potentially serious consequences for the permafrost below. What most people don't realize is that trapped under the permafrost here is a ticking time bomb for climate change. I've come to the underground laboratory here at the Permafrost Institute to learn more. The coolest part of the Permafrost Institute, <laughs> literally and figuratively, is the tunnel they've built underneath the building, 12 meters down. Here they can actually study the permafrost in situ. Leading expert Dr. Alexander Fedorov has observed some big changes. What is the main problem that they are studying? The permafrost melting. Right. The changes in temperature, the melting of the water, the depth of the water increases, and the cryogenic processes are Activizirates. Melting permafrost is releasing huge amounts of methane gas, causing global concern. Researchers have found lakes literally bubbling with methane. Permafrost acts like a lid, locking carbon gases like methane in the ground. All that gas was formed from long buried organic matter, dead animals, and plant life that have been on ice for thousands of years. Now, Increased heat is penetrating deeper into the permafrost, thawing it, and releasing these dangerous greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This could have a bigger impact on global warming than the burning of fossil fuels. Our carbon emissions cause the permafrost to melt, releasing methane gas, which causes the climate to warm, which causes the permafrost to melt even more runaway greenhouse effect that could put us in the position where it becomes irreversible. Every year, Dr. Fedorov and his team drill deep into the ground to analyze changes in the permafrost. How far down do you drill? Five meters, six meters. That's some tough stuff. Dr. Fedorov probes the permafrost in many locations. And what he's seeing in northern Yakutia is alarming. We have surface subsidence more than two meters. Surface su subsidence of yeah. two meters. It subsides. As the icy permafrost melts, the ground sinks. The formation of thaw ponds and lakes is rapidly increasing all over northeastern Siberia. You're seeing dramatic changes. Yes, yes. Scientists predict that the area of permafrost in the northern hemisphere will decline by 20 to 35 percent by the middle of this century releasing a monumental amount of greenhouse gas. But as the ground melts, it's also unearthing some fascinating finds. It looks like roadkill from last week, but it's 12,000 years old. While the melting permafrost is a major concern, there is one positive side effect. The thawing has led to some incredible discoveries. It's not just methane gas that's released by the melting permafrost. Sometimes things like woolly mammoths are found here. And Yakutia is the place in the world to find these frozen prehistoric creatures. There's a researcher here who's going to show me exactly what that's all about. The Mammoth Museum houses the most diverse collection of ancient animals in the world, some of which were recently exposed in the thawing ground. Do you think that as our climate gets warmer, it'll be easier to find more of these mammoths? Yeah. Today, Professor Grigoriev is taking me behind the scenes to show me some of his most impressive discoveries. Most important place in museum. Yes. Wow. Mammoth tusks. Yes. Very good preserved tusks of Malalekovsky mammoths with blood, with uh, muscles. And one of the first domesticated dog. On what the is road. the first domesticated dog? Geological age 12 and a half thousand. 12 and a half thousand years old. The pressure of layer upon layer of built up ice flattened this dog. It looks like roadkill from last week, but it's 12,000 years old. 
You can see the teeth and the hair, everything here. It's amazing. You can find similar find only in Yakutia. Without a question, this is the strangest walk-in freezer that I've ever been in. The discovery of prehistoric animals demonstrates that the land is thawing, but how much of it is melting is so far unknown. So I've met with a scientist, but what I want to do next is meet with the people who live off the land. I want to see how the melting permafrost is affecting them. I'm hitting the road and heading far north to some of the most isolated communities in Russia. I'll be camping with reindeer herders along the way to my ultimate destination, Omyakon, the coldest town on Earth. Eliona! Oh. Eliona and our driver, Artum, will be making the journey with me. It's going to take four days of driving in treacherous conditions. First, we need to get across the Lena River, which for now is frozen solid. At least that's what I like to believe. Today is about a eight to 10 hour drive, getting from Yakutsk up to Kandiga, and that's where we're gonna be spending the night. And back onto solid ground. We're now on the Kolyma Highway, otherwise known as the Road of Bones. It looks like any other road, but very few roads have the history that this one does. It was built during the Stalinist era by the prisoners of the infamous Gulag labor camps. The skeletons of the forced laborers who died during its construction were just buried into the road itself. The road is notoriously treacherous. It was laid on permafrost, so it's twisted and uneven. In places, it's very narrow and covered in a layer of thick snow. A common practice during the coldest part of the year is to never travel alone. If you break down and you've got no help, bad things happen very quickly when it's minus 50. It doesn't take long before we spot trouble up ahead. This truck lost its load of pipes and went right off the road. I've heard so many stories about this road, how dangerous it is. Usually the weather conditions are bad. This road lives up to its name. An hour and a half later, there's another accident. So the emergency services guys are down there right now. Oh, wow. It's been just one obstacle after another all day long, and we still have a long way to go. We press on, but getting to Omicon is not going to be easy. After sneaking in a few hours of sleep in Kandiga, we're back on the road early the next day. So the plan today is to go a little further north up to one of the Gulag areas. Heaven forbid, if you were a criminal or a political prisoner, this is where you would have been sent. Uh, it's quite a bit further north. It's going to take quite a few hours to get up there on a really bad road. And the camp is away from the road. So it's not going to be easy to find. There's a lot of barbed wire here. There's another building down there. The gulags were a vast system of prisons that spanned the entire Soviet Union. And between the 1930s and early 1950s, between 15 and 20 million people working hard labor, long hours, in all conditions, all seasons. Horrible. Work people to death. To honor the prisoners, locals have built a museum in their memory. Many were convicted of the most minor offenses, like Anna Aminalova. She survived, and her story can be told. But many did not make it out. These gates are not particularly high, not particularly strong, but then again, they didn't need to be in this terrain in Siberia. If you escape, you faced almost certain death in the wilderness. We're back.
back on the road of bones, and our plan is to reach the reindeer herders of Uchige first thing tomorrow. It's slow going, and we're down to one lane when we hit another roadblock. This is actually a pretty serious situation right now. We have several vehicles stuck on this road, and no one can move in either direction. Not good. Thankfully, it's not minus 50. Everyone pulls together, the road is cleared, and we can keep moving. We are free and clear for now. Fingers crossed. Time to switch up the mode of transportation. I'm joining the local reindeer herders for a journey into the wilderness. Their 1,400-year-old way of life is being threatened by the changing climate, and I want to understand more. Off to the next leg of my adventure. On a reindeer sled in Siberia. Woo! It's like dog sledding with less barking. Reindeer herders rely on the income from selling reindeer meat a staple in this part of the world. They're constantly moving and must trek every few weeks across this vast wilderness to find new pastures for their reindeer to graze. Whoa! Whoa! Ow. Oh. We just had some kind of harness failure. Ouch. After three hours of sledding, we've hit base camp. It's home for tonight. The temperature is minus 20, which is actually warm for this time of year, a trend the local herders have noticed. Every aspect of their life revolves around the weather, and they have to be able to work with it, work around it, and still be able to prosper and survive. But now, the warming climate and melting permafrost is slowly killing off the reindeer. Mikhail Pogodeyev has lived with the reindeer his entire life. He now advocates for their survival. When the climate is changing and you see that there are, there are changes on the snow, snow conditions, the reindeer will starve if, if uh, the pastures will be packed with the ice. As warm spells increase, the snow melts, leaving a layer of water but in a snap freeze, an ice crust forms that the reindeer can't penetrate to find food. 12,000 reindeer died of starvation last year. For the herders, climate change is very real. I'm camping out with the herders for the night. They're preparing a hearty meal, stew, hot tea, and vodka. The tradition they have here is to make a little sacrifice before every meal. Usually a bit of food or maybe a splash of vodka goes into the fire for good luck and health. It's time for bed. The sun is going down and so are the temperatures. It's minus 40 degrees and it's shaping up to be one of the coldest sleeps of my life. Tomorrow, the pole of cold is in our sights and even this place isn't immune to climate change. fire died about halfway through the night. Whew. Inside the tent, that's what happened to my water. It was kind of cold. It's time for me to leave the reindeer and carry on my journey north. We head out. We make sure to load up at the last gas station before Omyakon. After a day's driving, we make it to our final destination, the coldest town on Earth. It's a bumpy arrival. <laughs> I guess this is the kind of roads you get when you build your town on permafrost. The road just twists and buckles. In the 1920s and 30s, it was a seasonal stop for reindeer herders. Now, it's a permanent settlement of just 500 people. I finally made it to Oymyakon, the, the pole of cold. And on February 6, 1933, they recorded a temperature of minus 71.2 Celsius. 
extremely cold. Nowhere in the Northern Hemisphere has a temperature that low ever been recorded. It may be cold out, but our reception is warm. The locals are performing a traditional welcoming ceremony for us. So what is it about this place in particular that makes it so cold? The main reason is that Omicron sits in a valley. The cold air is trapped by these mountains, and it just sits there in pools. Beautiful blue sky, but bone-chillingly cold. But not as cold as expected. Today, it's minus 31. Aliona and I are at the local weather station, where we meet meteorologist Mika Bakarova. They've been recording temperatures for the last 50 years here and have observed some big changes. Local fishermen have noticed the shift as well. Arctic temperatures are expected to increase between one and a half to two and a half degrees by 2040 meaning the permafrost will continue to thaw at a dangerous rate. We're afraid that we're going to reach a tipping point where our carbon emissions cause the permafrost to melt, releasing methane gas, which causes the climate to warm, which causes the permafrost to melt even more. And you can see where this is headed. There's no doubt the temperature here is warming, but if global greenhouse emissions can be reduced, it may not be too late to halt this rise and keep the permafrost frozen. Thank you.